now invite Dr. Priya Goel to please deliver the gift of honor address. So please. <coughs> Uh, 
natural sources, but also the more living space. No, someone can be gone. Why the Second World War was fought? The Hitler had done two three principles. He wanted, uh, of course, the first principle was the German is the supreme class of the world. But the second was that he wanted a so called Russian living space for the people. So, living space has always been a cause of big geopolitics in the world. And if the Antarctic opens that kind of a venue, where the more living space is available, that will become a, one of the larger reasons of the geopolitics. <coughs> and that is going to be a very complicated issue there. So we have to really, uh, what, is it, what is our role? We are a, one of the largest we are the largest democracy in the world. And we have to a, play a role, a role of being a peacemaker a peace agent in Europe. And in that role, we can be there only if we are there. And how can we be there? Only if we are doing science. So here, I said, it's not the science part that is, part, that is a leading, but it's the politics part. We want to play our role, and so we have to do the science. That's something very important from the point of view of uh, the Arctic research. Of course, sir, that's wrong. They have brought up very nicely on the issues that is not only to the life sciences, on which he is expert, but also other aspects of uh, how to live in the colder region and how to make ourselves sustaining in the region. But the geopolitics of the Arctic is going to be largely accelerated the, when the impact of global warming is going to make more and more region available, more and more accessibility. It's going to be more complicated. Coming to Antarctic, where we have been playing a larger role, in terms of the research, and again, uh, I remember once Dr. Prasidrandra told me that we are we were number two in the world in terms of publications on the Antarctic research. That's something which uh, we feel very proud of it. But what has been governing the geopolitics of Antarctic? Thanks to the Antarctic Treaty, which actually has got two basic principles: public good and the common heritage of mankind. These principles have really been the guided principle of the uh, so-called geopolitics in the region. In spite of the fact that there are large claims from countries like Australia, Chile, etc. But as a part of the system, which we are part of it, we have avoided those kind of claims to be affected. Of course, they are supposed to be reviewed again in 2050. And we have to make sure that uh, not only in uh, 2050, but even later, this kind of a public good and so-called common heritage is retained for that region, we have to be active in that place. So again, if it comes to science, science is very, very important, but perhaps more important, the geopolitics of that region, in which we should be an active player. And this is where the uh, reason for us to be doing science as well as doing geopolitics, they are ready together and we have to be there. And from this point of view, I would say that the role if India so far has played is very positive. But that very important aspect is exploitation. Even in Antarctic, where we are not really seeing immediate uh, uh, search for the energy or minerals which have to grow. I do know that uh, Antarctic has got a huge oil reserves. But immediately this effect is the uh, tourism. Now, what do we do? How do we deal with that? There are two ways. One is this is something not good for the environment. This is not something good for the ecosystem. So should we resist that? If you ask me why personal view would be, we should keep that pristine land as pristine. We have no right to really destroy the ecosystem. But if you can't do it, if you can't succeed in that, then someone said, if you cannot stop thieves, then join them. If someone is good in getting advantage, and this is where the Dr. Sunur is one comes. If others are going to exploit tourism, we are not going to stop Chile or the North Sussex stop Chile in taking the aircraft to the and uh, for tourism purpose to the Antarctic, then what do we do? Then should we also not develop our own tourism industry? Now, these are the issues which are self evidently In fact, uh, I was reading somewhere a very interesting term which is applicable for Arctic and Antarctic as well as Himalaya. We are not talking of a Competitive nationalism, vis-a-vis cooperative internationalism. 
Now, competitive investments come then, okay, someone is creating a tourism, why not we do? So that's a competition. When we say cooperative uh, internationalism, internationalism requires that the land has to be protected, to be kept pristine. We should not spoil that, like what we have done with uh, Ganga cleaning or Ganga river. Not, tomorrow should not happen, okay, what we have done with the Antarctic, and we have to clean Antarctic. Should we, and at least Ganga cleans itself once in a year. But we, Ganga doesn't have to clean. You don't have to make it dirty. But if you make Antarctic dirty, there's no way Antarctic can clean itself by Ganga. You have to clean yourself. So this is something we need to really look at it. So in my perspective, the international, the, co the cooperative internationalism has to really far away more than the so-called competitive internationalism. Now coming to Himalayan region, this is something much more uh, important for us because this is our background. In fact, uh, Himalaya is not really just background, it's part of our body. In fact, it's the most important part of the body. Someone said Himalayan is uh, our head. Someone once said, no, is our pagdi. It's like uh, uh, honor for us. So that is the region in which, which is so important to us, is just even from the point of survival. Actually, India is India because of we use the river for uh, or the water from Himalaya, and in terms of the water, so the seepage water, but ultimately the source of water is Himalaya for us. But again, it's not just India no. We have Pakistan, we have China, we have Bangladesh, we have Nepal, and we are a sort of Himalayan region countries. Each one of us depend on Himalaya to large extent. But has what has been done? If you see the last five decades, the maximum harm has to has been done to the Himalayan region, particularly in terms of the invasion on the ecosystem, invasion of the culture. There are about 5 million people living in Himalayan region, in Tibet and all that. And what we have done, we mean it's not as a human society. We have drove them away. The Tibetans are living in all the way in Bangalore and uh, in remote places. But they, what happened to their houses or their culture or their, they are gone. And who is responsible? Again, a kind of a, uh, I would say, a competitive nationalist by some country has really affected the complete ecosystem of Himalaya. Now, can we allow it to degrade further? That's something which we need to think of. <coughs> Himalaya has got a one more problem. It's actually security issue. In fact, uh, someone was telling a long time that if you want to really create a trouble for another country, just create an artificial reservoir by putting some small rocks and you can explore them whenever you want it. Amount of water that will flow. When last year it happened naturally, there was a big, huge lake which was detected by our uh, experts in the remote sensing agency and other city, and the Hyderabad. That, that lake got blocked by a small uh, ranch activity, and the huge water got collected. If that water body breaks down, the a large portion of Hima, uh, Nepal and our behalf would have got so much flooded it would have last at least a few million people. Now that is a live bomb and whom, whom does it affect? It does not affect the rich people, it does not affect the armed forces, actually it affects most of poor people in the region. So these are big security issues and this kind of events which once in a while happen by uh, nature can always be induced by man. And if you do the, this kind of things start happening then you will have a big have a big uh, security issue in, in this region. We need to learn and create a mechanism to deal with such issues. In fact, uh, I felt that already has uh, the has taken my words. I was in my mind to suggest that we must come up with a mechanism of these countries in the Himalayan region. You call it a council, you call it something else. But it must be a geopolitical mechanism that the Himalayan region is not exploited for the reasons, for the causes that can destroy the human humanity anywhere, whether it's in Pakistan or India or China, doesn't matter. But this has, this is a need of history, not today. Because we know what uh, is happening in, let's uh, say, the Putra. It's very likely that after five years or ten years, we may not get even half water from Putra. But that is being done. We have no mechanism or international mechanism of coordinating such things. So there's a very strong need. In fact, I would really like, because we are discussing geopolitics, we must come up with some kind of a mechanism. We can create a working group which can come up with that kind of a suggestion that geopolitics together 
which has a, a right way of looking because there is no other field where these are so <coughs> closely coupled together. I wish all the success to this conference. Thank you.